You know, when I started, I just wanted to find out what makes cells grow and go wrong. And I'm still there uh, enjoying that dream. And I hope to share some of that with you today. So I'm gonna share, uh, start, try to share my screen and uh, navigate you through a bit of a story. And really, I wanna start by saying that we are standing now in the middle of a change in science, in stem cell biology, in my opinion, where we have to let go the um, comfort of the sort of anatomical view that we had of development until it sort of really started to be broken down in a very severe way by the discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells, which said it's not all one way. And now, it's being broken down by our appreciation that the different elements of development are not all coordinately regulated. And so we can have a diversity that we never anticipated. So I'm gonna take you through a bit of that story because I think it's very important, especially for those of you who are starting out to let go your parental teachers and grandparental advisors dogmas and really think uh, quite differently about how you want to set your priorities of what you want to do in the future. But just to take you back, because it's always important to go back and remember what some of the fundamentals uh, lessons were, where did the concept of stem cells begin, it, it actually did not begin with blood stem cells at all. It began like all um, areas of science, it began with technology. And the technology where it began was a microscope. The microscope was our first major technology in biology and it allowed us to see uh, what tissues looked like when they were fixed and and looking at tissues like the skin and the gut, um, you could actually see the process of differentiation occurring uh, right before your eyes with the, um, with the primitive cells at one part of the tissue and the most mature cells, I don't know if you can see my pointer, in a, in a sort of linear path downwards. So it was pretty obvious that if the mature cells were disappearing all the time, they had to be replaced. There must be cells at the top that knew how to maintain their own numbers so they didn't run out long before you uh, expired at the end of life. And so this concept of, of a, of a uh, cell that could sustain a tissue by differentiating as well as maintaining itself was actually, uh, um, couple centuries old. But the problem was this did not work well in the bone marrow because there, um, when you look in old fashioned ways at the bone marrow, you couldn't see how it was working. And, and so that was a very interesting problem. And there was a lot of debate until actually the late 1950s about how blood cell development occurred because it was known that mature blood cells must be replaced. And the big breakthrough actually came following the development of nuclear weapons uh, in the Second World War. And it became of great interest to the military to try to figure out how to protect people from the uh, lethal effects and the terrible sublethal effects of ionizing radiation. And so a lot of uh, funding was put into trying to figure that out. And actually was in Britain, in Great Britain, where it was discovered if you gave a mouse a lethal dose of radiation, one of the first systems to go was blood formation. And you could rescue that, not by injecting molecules, but by injecting cells from another mouse, a healthy mouse's bone marrow. And so that suggested that there must be a cell that could regenerate the blood forming system. And the hunt was on all over the world, actually, 
to try to find out what that cell was. And in Toronto, as illustrated on this slide, was this pair of scientists, Jim Till on the left and Bunny McCullough, uh, or Dr. Ernest McCullough on the right, a physician. And when I went to Toronto in the early 1970s, I um, sought to work with this couple and was actually officially mentored by Jim Till. <clears throat> so Jim, being a physicist, said, let's do a limiting dilution assay, a sort of quantitative approach to understanding how to uh, define a cell type. And I'm assuming most of you know what a limiting dilution assay is, so I won't describe it. But that worked well. The end point was what, what dose of cells must contain a stem cell because at that dose, only a proportion of the mice will stay alive and the rest will die. And Bunny being a physician, of course, thought you better look at the mice that are dying around that dose and see why they're dying and if there's anything interesting. So the story is he went in on the weekend and checked out the mice and he opened them up to do an autopsy as good physicians will do and noticed that the spleen had these bumps on it. So most of you won't remember, but back in those days, it was all about cloning, cloning bacteria, cloning viruses. And it was just starting to be understood that that might be a very powerful way of understanding how cells uh, respond to different treatments by virtue of their ability to grow and make progeny. So everybody was trying to develop clonal assays and was full of that idea. And Bunny and Jim thought, my goodness, maybe these are clones coming from these stem cells and these mice are dying just because they don't have enough of them. And so they built up this concept. They showed that they were in fact clones. Each bump was about a million cells derived from a single cell, which they showed genetically. And the other interesting properties of these clones, this is now, remember, almost 60 years ago, uh, were most of the what we call the myeloid lineages, red cells, neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, and megakaryocytes. And these were variably ex produced in these, in these different clones. And you could actually even harvest the clone when it was still viable, full of viable cells, and make a cell suspension and do the assay all over again and get new daughter clones, which was the first formal evidence of single cell self-renewal. So there, all of these concepts were born 60 years ago, and they also introduced the concept of using operational terminology to define cells rather than morphological criteria. Now we like to call those functional definitions, but really it, it, the idea is it's not based on morphology and that will become very important. So for 20 years, that was the stem cell assay in the field. And much derivative work was based on that. And then in the 1980s, it was discovered that actually those cells are not the cells that can sustain blood cell production lifelong. There were such cells and they could be identified by gene marking, which was introduced in the mid 1980s. But most of the CFUS, if not all of them, were not those cells. And you could in fact separate the other cells, but you couldn't purify them. So our lab set out to try to develop an assay. And just as a quick aside to you students and trainees, it's a good idea to read your supervisor's past publications, not just the ones from last year, but maybe a few years ago. So in the 1980s, we, our group set out to develop an assay. And I looked in the recent literature and thought, oh, let's do a limiting dilution assay. Never having read Jim Till's first paper. Can you believe that? Anyway, so it turned out the biology of the system allows such a assay to be developed with very high uh, 
sensitivity and precision. So you can put a single cell into a sublethally irradiated mouse, or a mouse that's been radio protected after, with, with uh, short-term repopulating cells and detect its progeny genetically. And from a limiting dilution assay, define its frequency. And from that, you can then use uh, strategies to learn how to purify it. And again, the same concepts that were um, revealed for spleen colony forming cells held true for these, but at a higher level, more lineages, <coughs> greater self renewal capacity, but heterogeneity remained the name of the, the, the name of the game. And then um, about uh, 10 to 15 years later, when immunodeficient mice were developed at the Jackson labs, John Dick's lab and ours uh, simultaneously published that you could apply the same assay to human cells. But it turned out eventually when we had the kind of mice that we now have today, the kind of highly immunodeficient mice, that the cells that repopulate these mice from human origin are actually made up not of one cell type, but multiple cell types that actually uh, reflect the same series of changes in their repopulating and lineage output potentials as in the mouse. So you have waves of cells that come from cells of, with different phenotypes that have various durabilities of output potential, various delays in when their clonal progeny appear. And just uh, 10 years ago, John Dick's lab isolated for the first time at 10% purity, a, a cell type that has this long phenotype, which henceforth I'll just call 49F cells for short, that we think are the, the best uh, phenotype that we know about to uh, identify a cell that has uh, very extensive self-maintaining and output potential. So that's great. That sort of cemented in everybody's mind this hierarchical structure, which I'm trying to going to try to convince you is so oversimplified it's no longer particularly useful. But nevertheless, there's still lots of people entertaining this. And the concept has been that you could use different phenotypes that had predominantly different lineage potentials. And then you could just isolate the phenotype and directly molecularly characterize it and then understand how it came to be from the cell from which it originated and the cell uh, and its potential to give rise to certain types of daughter cells. And there's still lots of people doing that. But the problem is that mice, which we also have worked with over the years, studies of mice were beginning to uh, tell us that a lot of the assumptions that underpin that model were incorrect. Because in the mouse, by this time, we already had methods to purify mouse hematopoietic stem cells that would serially repopulate animals two or three times. Uh, were, were heterogeneous, they were not all multipotent, that their uh, intrinsic properties can change markedly throughout development and aging. So there's heterogeneity at one moment in time and there's heterogeneity across development of a individual mouse. And their survival and their proliferation and their self-renewal can all be differentially regulated by growth factors. So there was, Already we knew there was a lot more heterogeneity, at least in the mouse system, and we anticipated that would be true in the human system. So about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, I thought this is the new concept to embrace. Heterogeneity is what we want to understand. And the best way to do that is to be agnostic just the same as using a limiting dilution assay. So, um, so I uh, 
learned that the uh, group in Groningen had developed barcoding and applied it to some hematopoietic cells. And I persuaded this uh, student up here, Long Nagoyan, who has actually worked in mammary area in our group, to, to start his PhD by building a large um, DNA barcoded lentiviral library where every barcode is different. So every virus contains a different barcode and you can transduce cells at limiting dilution. So every cell only gets one marker and then you can track their viable progeny by sequencing the progeny and inferring uh, how many different phenotypes and at what time those progeny were produced. So there's um, Martin Hurst who helped Long make the library. And before Long could do a mammary experiment, the current heme team in our group said, ah, oh, we're gonna try this on cord blood. So they did an experiment with um, cells that went into two mice. I'm just gonna show you one of the two, they're very similar. And what you can see in red is the barcodes that showed up at those times. And the black lines are the barcodes that, or the cells with barcodes that actually persisted. So the red ones are the ones that only were seen once at one moment in time, and the blacks are the fraction that actually persisted. So you can see from these red lines that the patterns are very similar to what the phenotype data showed us, but there are exceptions and the exceptions increase over time. And not only that, at late times, there's a mixture. There's a mixture of cell of clones that have persisted and a small number of clones that have appeared for, for the first time. So that's already um, a little um, confusing and uh, uh, negates the simplicity of our original ideas. Not only that, the lineage represented in those barcoded clones were nothing like what we expected. So over here on the left, you see this beautiful multi-lineage clone. Each color is myeloid B cell and T cell, I believe, which is what everybody puts in their their papers as the representative multi-lineage clone from a 49F cell. But this is not true. These are not 49F cells. These are cells, these are all the clones that were seen uh, at seven months post-transplant. And actually only about 10% were of this type. All the rest were these other weird types. Some were even single lineage appearing late and some appeared early, disappeared, and came back again. So that just illustrates the kind of heterogeneity that we hadn't envisaged. So then along come these fellows, uh, David Knapp, Colin Hammond, and Fang Wu. David's gone on to a position in Montreal, and Colin is just about to graduate, and Fang Wu uh, in a couple of years. So they said, let's actually purify 49F cells and barcode each one and see what they actually do. So, uh, so that's what they did because we had taken some of the barcode viruses and made them individually so we could make a prep uh, with a single barcode and put it into a single cell, or at least I should say that's what these folk did. So they collected 684 individual 49F cells into single cell dishes and barcoded, um, transduced them and uh, obtained a proportion that were barcoded, put them into 12 mice because we had about 50 different barcode, uh, barcoded viruses. And then, uh, we're able to analyze the marked progeny of these in these 12 mice over time for at least 30 weeks. And here's the result of analyzing the clones that they got. And you can see the, from this uh, pie chart that the vast majority, again, were not multi-lineage. So even looking within this defined phenotype, the vast majority are not 
multi-lineage. There are many that are myeloid restricted, and there are many that are B lymphoid restricted. And this didn't even really look at uh, T cells very well because you don't get very good T cell repopulation. Okay. So then we went deep into heterogeneity. And this just slide summarizes the um, what, what you can do with a CYTOF that measures about 40 proteins inside and outside signaling, transcription factors, and surface markers. The heterogeneity that is now possible to reveal when you look agnostically at, at uh, 49F cells for all of these different markers. And the same is true using single-cell RNA-seq, and the same is true using single-cell methylome uh, analysis. In spite of the fact that you can still group the cells, the overlap is huge and the heterogeneity is huge. And that's what we need to think about, as I'll come to in a minute. So these folk went on to look not just at the 49F cells, but all of the cells in the 34 compartment using more sensitive um, in vitro assays to reveal that what we thought these cells were by their names is really not true, that their predominant outputs were as described, but their minor outputs are still quite extensive and their cloning efficiencies are not nearly what we uh, would like to think by extrapolating from what we see. So Fang Wu went on to actually develop better systems for isolating cells with uh, more restricted erythroid neutrophil monocyte and lymphoid output potential, as you can see from these bar graphs, and compare those in, in the CYTOF plot of the 40 uh, antigens that we looked at and show that they were much better. You can see erythroid, her, her phenotype to capture the progenitors of erythroid cells is much more um, confined than the original one, but still a lot of heterogeneity. So, so there is heterogeneity, however you mix and match the markers you look at. Nevertheless, they were able to use the markers that they had um, analyzed with the CYTOF to look at all of the cells they had um, index sorted and develop uh, pseudotime map differentiation trajectories uh, mathematically and end up with, with a topology of the heterogeneity of differentiation shown here for erythroid cells and neutrophils, but the B cells they did at the, or the B lineage cells they did at the same time. So here's the same thing shown in a sort of three-dimensional plot. And you can see all of these trajectories. So this was just for cord blood, but we know things are different all the way through the lifespan. And so now I have two kids working on fetal cells and aging cells. So I'm gonna just briefly describe some of that. So here's Colin comparing a whole range of phenotypes from cells all the way from the neonate to the adult from cord blood and in the adult from young to older in the bone marrow. And the remarkable finding here, unexpected, is that the blood phenotypes run together when you look at the total 34 compartment and the bone marrow cells segregate together. So here's the bone marrow guys, and here's the peripheral blood guys. When you do a UMAP analysis of all of these markers to look at different components of the 34 population. And what about aging? So here's an experiment Fang Wu had done back when, when we did the barcoding experiment to, um, to compare to the in vivo pie chart I showed you, which is actually almost identical. And here's Colin and Feng Wu repeating the experiment now again with gourd blood. You can see how it replicated several years later. And now young adult bone marrow and older adult bone marrow not showing the predicted um, loss of lymphoid output potential 
when assayed in this very permissive in vitro system that everybody thinks they're gonna find because lymphopoiesis goes down in the older individuals. And that has yet to be figured out. Is this due to the assay system that we look at or is this due to uh, a, a complete change in how cells behave in vitro from in vivo? So what else can we learn uh, by comparing these 49F cells from people of different ages? Well, Colin started to look at their proliferative ability. And what he found was that didn't change either when you analyze how cells grow in a a uh, standard long-term culture system where the cells are grown for six weeks on, on, on feeders with growth factors, and then just analyzed for their differentiated myeloid output potential. But what he did find was that the older the source of the hematopoietic stem cell, the slower they got going and produced progeny over many weeks in these uh, stromal-containing cultures. So then he moved on to um, a more rapid uh, elicitation of proliferation, which you can achieve by putting the cells in uh, serum-free liquid cultures and monitoring single cell behavior over time. So now we're talking hours, not weeks. And again, you can see under the most optimal conditions, the older the source of the cells, the slower it is to get through its first division, and that's true even for the second division. But what was brand new was that not only are they slower, they're more dependent on growth factors. So as you dilute the growth factors down, they are much more slowed down. Okay. So that's a glimpse into where we're going. Similar work going on in the in uh, with fetal human hematopoietic cells. But why is this really important for leukemia? Because we think all the evidence points to the idea that leukemia originates from a single cell, and it probably matters quite a bit what are the properties of that single cell, and. The studies in the mouse, and even to some extent what I showed you in the human situation, is that the properties in a primitive cell tend to be retained by their progeny. So uh, the spectrum of what we see is very much influenced by the spectrum of very primitive cells that are created in the first place. So what about leukemia? Well, everybody else studying malignancy these days is going after trying to get cells out of the patient that has the disease and then analyzing them various ways, usually some kind of sequence method, but now increasingly proteomically, and infer backwards how the clone evolved, what's its heterogeneity. The problem, there are many problems with that approach. One is the sample size, the inability to track the thing over time uh, prospectively. And more importantly for me, everybody else is doing it. So we don't want to compete with people who have huge labs and are, are applying that advantage. We, we tend to try to rely on our creativity. So the idea was let's, let's try to see how it begins. Let's actually make it. So that's not a new idea. The, most people have been doing that for years very productively, and like they sort of own that, that strategy. But we think maybe we'll learn something new and better and different if we start with human cells. That's not a new idea either. It's just been very difficult. But now with increasing um, skills and uh, tools to introduce genes and manipulate genes in human cells, it was worse when we started this aggressively uh, 10 or 15 years ago to think uh, again about it. But since it, we knew it was difficult, my dear husband, Alan, with whom I worked most of my lifetime, now he's kind of retired and runs a business, but fortunately uh, the laws were passed 
right after he had to retire so that I don't have to retire. And we're both very happy with that uh, situation. Anyway, we worked together on chronic myeloid leukemia for many years. <clears throat> and, uh, and we appreciated, as I'll show you in a minute, that most patients with chronic, <clears throat> with chronic myeloid leukemia are actually diagnosed at a very early stage of their disease. But in the old days, before Gleevec, most of them inevitably progressed to a blast crisis phase, which was an acute AML or ALL type situation, which was incurable. <clears throat> so the idea was we would take chronic phase cells and put genes in them. They were already predisposed to want to progress and we could tip the balance. So that was the strategy which I've just described to you, maybe ahead of showing you the diagram. So here are this, the patients appearing in chronic phase where the feature is too many cells, the uh, pre-malignant clone overgrows and suppresses normal differentiation from normal progenitors, but the clonal preneoplastic cells still differentiate normally. Often these patients don't even know they have a disease. And then over time, they used to progress. Now, Gleevec kind of stops all this, but they used to progress to an acute leukemia. And one could often anticipate that because there was a change in the numbers and insensitivity to hydroxyurea or other treatments that used to be used and some change in the morphology before they became real blast cells. And one of the changes was an increase uh, of basophils and eosinophils. So we started this adventure, or at least I should say Ivan Sloma, a postdoc came and started this adventure by saying, let's try a gene that gives back to the chronic myeloid leukemia stem cells, which we had shown back in the 1980s have actually a defective self-renewal. They have a overworking proliferative ability. That's why the clone takes over. But when they're actually out and out competing with the normal cells, they don't do so well. And that's why you can cure them with Gleevec because they retain a normal stem cell population. It just doesn't outcompete later on in the differentiation hierarchy. Anyway, Keith Humphreys, uh, at the time downstairs, had identified this uh, fusion gene between NUP98 and HOX-A10 and isolated the homeo domain of the HOX-A10 and stuck it together with NUP98 and made a fusion gene that turned out would hugely amplify mouse stem cells and we showed together would have uh, not as profound effect, but a slight effect on normal human hematopoietic stem cells. So the idea was that we would take that gene and stick it in CML cells and cure their self-renewal ability and make them outcompete the normal guys and that would cause them to become leukemic. So that's what Ivan tried. And sure enough, as you can see, the transduced cells did produce more progeny and the controls as expected uh, declined under conditions where normal cells would be do much better, but uh, they didn't become leukemic. They retained their normal differentiation ability. And this was true even in vivo, which I won't show here because in the interest of time. So then Ivan said, well, okay, I'm going to take a similar gene, NUP98 HOXA9, which actually is present in some CML blast crisis and stick it into these chronic phase CML cells, same as before. So he did that. And sure enough, it rapidly produced a stem cell, uh, a stem cell program in the total 34 compartments. So that was very exciting. And that program was consistent with a bad prognosis AML feature. 
But when he put those cells in mice, although they transformed further, and even some died from their disease, our, our pathological diagnosis of what was going on was that these had progressed maybe into a advanced accelerated or sort of mild dysplastic phase, but not an acute leukemia. So then along comes Philip Beer and frustrated says, okay, I'm gonna just survey a whole bunch of genes. So he made all these vectors and said, I'm going to run them in Ivan's original test system, which is to run chronic phase cells transduced with my test uh, vector and against um, the same cells transduced with a control empty vector and see who makes more cells in a long-term culture, in a co-culture situation, which I can track because they'll be labeled with different fluorochromes. So here's all the different things he put together for various reasons. Here's NUP98 HOXA9, which is a sort of positive control. And as you can see, it works. It, it, the, the transduced NA9 cells overgrow the control cells by huge amounts, even for 12 weeks in these cultures. And here's IK6. What is IK6? It's a, it's a version of Icaros that acts as a dominant negative uh, suppressor of Icaros because Philip was dreaming of making acute lymphoid leukemia blast crisis, not myeloid blast crisis. And he thought this might do it because Icaros uh, is often suppressed in, in or mutated in, in that form of blast crisis. And here's Mick. I don't know why I included Mick. Anyway, so these three genes. So he decided to work on Icaros, thinking that might be interesting. And what he found was, make a long story short, because this is also published, is what it created was accelerated phase. The symptoms of overproduction of cells with a eosinophil basophil phenotype. That's what this slide shows. So then being a physician, Philip said, well, let's actually go and look at CML and see if this has any relevance. So we collected a lot of biopsy samples from around the world. And uh, Wendy Erber from Australia kindly stained them with an Icaros antibody. So here you can see a normal control Icaros sitting in the nucleus where it's supposed to be. And here's doing the same in chronic phase CML. And lo and behold, Icaros is gone from most chronic phase or accelerated phase uh, sorry, accelerated phase or blast crisis phase cells. So this is a unique finding serendipitously discovered with this vector. And of course, it's not a feature of the vast majority of acute myeloid leukemia. So it could even be, if you like, a kind of diagnostic test for accelerated phase, except they're probably just as good routine ways of doing it, but very interesting. Okay, so what about Mick? You see, that was what you were advertising. So I'll finally get to Mick. So along comes Lisa, I believe a summer student or uh, postgrad student working with Philip Beer. And she says, I want to work with Mick. So what about Mick? I said, well, we're running out of chronic phase cells. Now we're well into the Gleevec era. We don't get the huge numbers of chronic phase cells we used to. And they're very precious. So I'm not going to trust a new graduate student with that. Start with some normal cells. So she said, OK. So she took the MYC virus, put it into cord blood 34 cells, shows that it upregulated MYC uh, a bit, not too much, all looking good. So I said, OK, put it in some mice. So that's what she did. And this is the big finding. Lo and behold, when she put it into our standard NRG mice, nothing happened. Mice just did fine. She put it into the same mouse that is transgenically producing human IL-3, GM, CSF, and stem cell factor, which we created back in the 1990s with Keith, because we knew these were three growth factors, the most equivalent of which acts poorly, if not at all, 
on human cells and was well known to be the primary stimulant of acute myeloid leukemia cells even back in the 1980s. So we created that mouse and then back-crossed it into every immunodeficient version of mice that were developed ever since. So now we have it in these NRG mice. And lo and behold, those mice died like a stone. And they died because they were full of a MYC positive human leukemia, which you can see examples of here and had a kind of classic 33 positive, uh, CD33 positive, CD123 positive, but interestingly, 34 negative uh, uh, phenotype also not expressing standard uh, mature myeloid or, or lymphoid markers. So the next question was, which, if any or all, of the growth factors were critical for this observation? So she took advantage of the fact that the NRG mice don't support the genesis of leukemia from the MYC transduced cells. And she co-transduced the input cells with human IL-3 or human GMCSF or all three together for human SCF. And then put the cells, some of which would have both, some of which would have only one, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can see is that only the mice that received at least GMCSF or IL-3 production inside them got the leukemia and died. So that was interesting, perhaps not terribly surprising because we know IL-3 and GMCSF actually act through the same signaling moiety. So the other issue that Lisa thought would be interesting to address was what cell do you have to start with? Because even a few years ago, it was still believed that you had to start with a stem cell. You couldn't just start with any old highly differentiated cell. Although there was evidence you could do it in mice, there was not prevailing um, thought that you could do it with human cells. So she purified GMPs, even though we have a better phenotype, because we thought we would never be able to publish unless we used what everybody wanted to see. So she actually did isolate GMPs and transduced them in a limiting dilution experiment. So we would not only compare whether they could be transduced, but what their relative susceptibility to uh, a leukemogenic transformation would be. And that was a very surprising experiment. First of all, because the, the potency of this phenomenon is so high, one in 14 of these cells can be make a lethal leukemia and pretty quickly. And the potency of the GMPs, which are much later and normally hardly will even get into the recipient mouse, will do it at just a slightly higher frequency. Not only that, but you can take the cells from the primary mice and put them into secondary or even tertiary mice and get a leukemia, although the latency is much longer. And I can come back to that later if you want to talk about it. So here's the heterogeneity of phenotypes of these different leukemias. You can see they range in every individual leukemia. Some are very consistent and some are very variable and some are almost never expressed, at least with the sensitivity of a flow cytometer. And here is an experiment where she measured the clonogenic activity of the leukemic cells from a moribund series of mice. And what you can see is the frequency is very low, sometimes undetectable, very similar, in fact, to what we see in a full-blown human leukemia where the proportion of accumulated blasts makes the frequency of the progenitors very low. And we think may explain the very long latency that we get when the same cells are transplanted into secondary or tertiary recipients. So of course we did also the RNA-seq, both bulk and single cell, and you can find various um, 
upregulated and downregulated genes within the topmost altered transcripts. And at the single cell level, you can also see heterogeneity with some cells having features of dividing cells and the vast majority looking as we expected, like um, terminal non-dividing cells. So let's get back now to what we think is probably the most interesting finding of all, which we're just beginning to explore. And that is what is going on in these NRG mice that don't die. So now uh, Lisa also had been tracking these cells. I didn't tell you before, but it isn't because the mixed cells don't go in and repopulate the mice. Not only do they do that, they behave just like normal cells. They produce all lineages, including the primitive 34 cells. They make mature B cells and even T cells. So the question was, are they sort of the failures or are they something else? So the experiment was to take these cells out of the mice and try to put them now into mice that are expressing the growth factors on which the original leukemic transformation in primary mice is dependent and see what happens. And lo and behold, what happened was in these mice, the leukemia was immediately stimulated to become activated, grow, amplify, and kill the mice. Whereas in the secondary NRG mice, this did not happen. In fact, the cells behaved like normal cells in a secondary transplant, poorly engrafted, poorly uh, repopulated the secondary mice, and the secondary mice were just fine uh, in terms of viability. And since the paper, I think, she's gone on and uh, actually isolated from these the MYC positive 34, positive 38, negative, and the MYC positive GMPs. And they, that's not what this graph is, but the graph is identical. And it even still does this at not as a remarkable a fre frequency as the primary cells would do it, but still at a very high frequency. So this is a very robust latent phenotype that we are just beginning to try to think about <laughs> how to understand and define at a molecular level. So I just have a few minutes left, and I would like to take the opportunity to just give you a quick overview of how this thinking has led us, and I hope you, to think about other tissues. Uh, just as we've thought about a lot of the principles of stem cell biology leaking into other, how, how we think about other tissues and vice versa. So I got interested in the mammary gland and breast cancer uh, around 1989, 1990, with the publication by Bill Peters that autotransplants were gonna cure breast, uh, stage three breast cancers. And since Alan was also running the bone marrow transplant program here, part of my responsibility was to think of uh, new ways of supporting what the transplant physicians were doing all the time. And one of the issues that arose in worrying about how they were going to handle all these breast cancer patients was what would happen when they put hematopoietic growth factors into these patients? Because we had actually, at that very moment, Myself, together with Shaki Dedhar, another physician, uh, another scientist at the BC Cancer Research Center, had discovered that these kind of things we called hematopoietic growth factors at the time could actually stimulate non hematopoietic cells. That was when, it, against all the evidence that had been produced up to that moment, but that was a very bona fide observation. And one of the cell lines was a breast cancer cell line. So we were very worried that maybe that would stimulate the breast cancers to grow. And I thought we better actually look at real 
breast cancer cells, not just the cell line. So I went to Joanne Emmerman, a local uh, scientist, who was actually the person who developed the first method to grow human mammary cells in tissue culture as a postdoc with Mina Bissell. Many of you will know because she's just up the road from you. And, and uh, Joanne had stocks of, of cells, both normal and normal reduction mammoplasty samples and samples from patients with breast cancer. And so we set up a collaboration to, to see if these added growth factors would do anything. So that was a great little study, and it turned out totally negative. But what I, what I learned was these cells grew like crazy in culture, and that the system actually just had two lineages. Now we think maybe three or more, but Anyway, in those days, we thought two. So I thought, oh, this is real simple. I'm used to, you know, blood is very complicated. We can just zoom in here and recreate the hierarchy with stem cells and progenitors. And, and Joanne said, you're crazy. But um, she said, okay, you can try, and I'll even let you have my graduate student to help you work on that. So here he is, John Stingle. So he took that on his project first couple of years just learning how to get the cells separated into a single cell suspension without being dead and going through the cell sorter without having us disallowed from ever going there again because it was clogging up the sorter. But anyway, he did that. And we soon found out you could separate mouse cells and human cells into these three compartments. And here's the stromal cells that we can't get rid of when we remove the hematopoietic and endothelial cells ahead of time. And you can grow these things in colonies with sort of fibroblast feeders, and they are either pure, luminal, or basal, or they can be mixed, so come from a multipotent cell. And John and Peter actually devised a stem cell assay where the cells were put in collagen gel under the kidney capsule of immunodeficient mice with uh, feeders, and they would recreate a human mammary glandlet, if you like, that was histologically indistinguishable from the normal tissue from which they came. This was a property exclusive to this basal cell compartment, and you could harvest these, make a single cell suspension, and regrow colonies of this ilk. And that actually became the basis of a limiting dilution assay for these cells. So we've played with these cells, we've purified them, we've isolated them, various people have characterized them. And that's the kind of thinking about the hierarchy. These are just some properties that have been developed, the epigenomes, the transcriptomes, the et cetera, et cetera. Most data is now querying this hierarchy and suggesting even as in now in the blood forming system, some of these early cell types may have extensive self-sustaining ability. And so maybe there's a kind of upper, higher level stem cell population, but stem cell properties that can be held lower down. That's still a work in progress now in the human system. But here's Long again. Long wanted to work on human breast cancer. That's why he was interested in making vectors. He did a lot of work doing the clonal analysis, which I won't go into, um, of the human mammary system. But here he is at the end of his PhD several years ago. Now he's a breast cancer oncologist finishing his final uh, um, specification, where he took some of Philip Beer's ve vectors that corresponded to the most popular pathways affected in breast cancer and stuck them in some mammary cells to see if he could make a tumor by using the in vivo assay system. So here's his first, or one of his very first experiments. And lo and behold, beginner's luck like Lisa, K Newton KRAS turns to be, out to be the one of the three genes he tried alone in combination works on its own and is not helped by TP53 or PI3 kinase mutant genes. These are invasive ductal carcinomas by pathology review 
and they contain, even though they are lousy little tumors and they sort of grow rapidly and then stop growing but self-sustain, still they will contain cells that will make secondary tumors and they are invasive. So since then, we've been trying to understand, because now we have a prospective system, what are some of the early consequences of introducing this transforming oncogene? And one of the genes we've been looking at is YB1. YB1 is a gene with many, many different um, gene product activities, but one of which is regulating translation. And it's often upregulated in aggressive breast cancers. So here's Sylvain Lafour, a postdoc, made uh, shRNA to knock down that and see gene, which is upregulated in the KRAS tumors, and ask, would that have any effect? And lo and behold, it absolutely knocks out the tumorigenic capacity of the KRAS, the mutant KRAS, not only in our primary system, but in one of the most aggressive breast cancer cell lines that we know of that actually has very potent metastatic activity. We just do an IV injection, which these cells don't. Knock out YB1, the cells can, cannot go anywhere there, or if they go somewhere, they're killed. So that's a very interesting lead, and we're pursuing that now to understand all the consequences and roles of YB1. But Silva, of course, wasn't satisfied any more than we were that we had these lousy little non-progressively growing tumors. Here's the KRAS tumor after about four to six weeks. So he tried a bunch of genes just like Philip Beer had done in the hematopoietic system. And here's meristylated AKT. Turns out meristylated AKT is commonly deregulated in DCIS in people. And when you put it into these cells, it does exactly the same thing. So we think this is the first model of DCIS in the humans. And here's Susanna Tan, a mid-stage mid PhD student, who's now gone on and tried a whole bunch of genes from the literature and also from a model in prostate cancer. And sure enough, if you do all, add all of these together, or even some of them, you get progressive and eventually with all four, these humongous tumors that we uh, actually have to sacrifice the mice because the tumors are so big, the animal people won't let us keep them any longer. They're not metastatic, but unlike the KRAS tumors, they are not with cells that are ER positive or PR or HER2. These are triple negative consistently. So um, quickly, I'll just conclude. I hope I've convinced you that primitive cells are much more heterogeneous, both molecularly and biologically, than previously anticipated. That mutations may be required to transform human cells, but not necessarily exclusively. The environment may have a lot to do with it. And robust models of latent, as well as variably aggressive transformed states can be reproducibly and efficiently created de novo from normal human cells, freshly isolated from either hematopoietic or mammary sources. So those are our two playgrounds. And whether the differentiated state of the initial cell mutated matters remains unclear. So on that note, I just want to remind you all that this is what I'm most proud of. This is the family of trainees that I've had the good luck and good fortune to, to parent. In the blue box are the ones that are in the lab right now. We're just getting back full steam next week, I understand. So we hope we will join you. Here's Alan up here. Always with a nice smile while he's criticizing me. And I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the fact that I'm supported by not only wonderful collaborators, but also support team that 
look after all this stuff that we have to do now to be in a lab. So that's it, everybody. If there's any questions, I'd be very happy. This is the view out my office. If any really motivated, talented postdoc who loves bioinformatics wants to come and play in this playground, um, I'm looking. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Connie. That, that was just wonderful and, and quite provocative. Um, and uh, um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I, what I was intrigued about, there was a number of things I was intrigued about, <clears throat> but um, this is maybe somewhat philosophical, but the, your experiment in which you found that the mice harbored latent oncogenic potential with the MYC, but did not really express it until you had an intervention, raises one of these age-old questions as to whether, and I'd like to get your opinion, are we born with cancer? Or from the earliest stages of embryogenesis or organogenesis, just waiting for the right trigger to make it manifest itself, and it may not happen until old age or other times of adulthood? Well, that's a great question. Um, and there are a number of things I can say in response to it. I think it's a good example that we all used to think we're perfect at the beginning and then slowly go downhill, just like development. And I think that notion is just about as imperfect as what I tried to illustrate in this talk. Having said that, I recall, you know, a number of years ago, one of our early collaborators was uh, a pathologist who actually brought cytogenetics into cancer pathology diagnostics. So you can turn the clock back to the 70, 1970s. But anyway, she was studying abortuses. And one of her early uh, teachings, if not observations, was uh, the surprise to me that a huge proportion of fertilized eggs in people are actually cytogenetically abnormal and aborted. So that is a very interesting observation because it tells you, you know, this notion of perfection is a selected notion. It's not, it's not sperm going into eggs is perfect, starts perfect. It actually starts rarely perfect or not so frequently as we used to want to think perfectly. And actually, I shouldn't say abortion. I should say miscarriage. Oh, God, how, how did I say that? <laughs> um, miscarriage. I meant miscarriage. So <laughs> miscarriage is a way evolution has allowed us to sort it out. And the rest of life is all about sorting it out and selecting. Having said that, we all know that there are pediatric leukemias that start in utero. So there are definitely some malignancies that start very early. I think most of our cells are, are genetically not mutated in a, in a cancer predisposing way uh, when we're born. But we now know that this progressively accumulates over time in almost every tissue. I do believe that mutation is very important uh, component. It's a very efficient way of disturbing how a cell behaves and making sure it happens in the progeny. So I don't think we should think mutations are not relevant. I think they're very relevant. It's just we used to think that that's all we had to think about. And what I'm trying to suggest is maybe there's a lot more to what actually allows a tumor to develop. And there may be all sorts of different stages. We, I say to the kids in the lab all the time, we don't know what is the definition of malignancy. If you're a physician, you know what it is because you know what to tell your patient. Because historically, you know, if this happens and this happens and we see this and we see this, this is likely to happen to you. <laughs> so we call that, you know, the news of, of malignancy. But if you're a biologist, 
and you're at, trying to ask, when is it and when isn't it? Then we encounter the heterogeneity purposely, especially if we have an experimental system, we're not just watching what actually happens to happen in a person. And I think we're learning that it's like the cells from which they come, very heterogeneous. And there's not a singular trajectory. There can be, but it's not singular. Even chronic myeloid leukemia, my goodness, the heterogeneity that we encountered, unbelievable. And we thought that was the prototype, the simple prototype. So I believe we have to think quite differently. You know, I think cancer is not a whole lot different from schizophrenia, quite frankly. <laughs> if I can use that as an analogy, because we usually say, oh, that's so complicated. I want to work on something simpler. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, that was, that was a very thought provoking kind of uh, answer. And in fact, it, it uh, Ani Deshpan posed a question that maybe is kind of relevant to this, and you may have already addressed it. But uh, besides complimenting you on a spectacular talk, he wanted to know, can you please elaborate on latent hematopoietic cells that are perhaps waiting for the right cytokine signals to promote malignant transformation? And how does aging play a role in this? Yeah, so that is sort of the, the song of the day that we know as people age, uh, with increasing sensitivity, everybody gets abnormal clones and everybody does not get leukemia before they die of something else. So I think the probability of potential leukemic clones is very high. And um, every day you look at your what's coming out in the published world, you see another paper on evoking this idea that inflammation increases with old age and if you protect yourself against it or you're predisposed to it, those are positive and negative factors. But it's, it's, a, it's a messy scenario. You know, inflammation, what is inflammation? You know, it's, a, it's almost as bad as cancer. These are words that we've ascribed to phenomena that we don't know how to define. And the words are, are no longer terribly helpful. They, they get us publications, but they really don't put the finger on mechanism. We really need to go in and see what is happening, not just anatomically at a molecular level, but dynamically. And that, that's very tricky. Uh, so, I do believe that synthetic biology is going to overturn that barrier, but we're not, you know, we're not all embracing that and using it yet. I don't know if that answers the question, but you know, if I were starting over, that's where I would want to be. That's great. I think we're down to probably our last question. And again, this is also somewhat philosophical. Uh, and I guess it goes back, and it, it, it uh, plays off of your focus of late on heterogeneity. And uh, it, it, it kind of gets to some of the early, early questions of the stem cell field, which was the distinction between fate and potential, meaning that sometimes the fate of what you see doesn't reflect what the potential of the cell would have been, nor does the potential of a cell pretend what its fate will be. And I guess a lot of that depends on the microenvironment. So I'm wondering, or the, the, we're wondering, the questioners are wondering whether, could you alter this heterogeneity? In other words, what you observe was happening in vivo to a large extent in a particular environment that either was natural or, or you created. Could you completely shift that heterogeneity or bias to a particular lineage if you would change certain aspects? So that's a great question. Um, the ability to turn the clock back all the way to the equivalent of an embryonic cell uh, tells you that the ability to modulate the genome of a cell without killing it 
I don't mean the sequence of DNA. I mean the uh, hierarchy of, or the, uh, the architecture of the cell and where every molecule is in it is malleable to an extent that we never anticipated. So it, it's pretty clear that that doesn't happen in a normal organism's lifetime very often because we had to discover it by manipulating cells. Right. On the other hand, it says it is possible and it may even explain some of this uh, discovery law many years ago, decades ago, that you sometimes see abnormal cell types in malignant populations that don't belong there. And, you know, there was, why is that and how is that? But if the thing is so screwed up by the malignancy, maybe you could imagine that. But I think that was telling us that the epigenome, the signaling apparatus, the the architecture of the cell is not immutable. Having said that, you can take an IPS cell that you've made from a tumor and it doesn't make it normal again. It, it still retains some of the features of that. And I don't think it's just the, um, the, the DNA sequence consequence. So I, we, we really don't know what we can manipulate and what we can't or how difficult it might be or what are the other consequences. But that is the playground of the future. I think we now know those are possible. Those are subject to exploration. It's just we don't know exactly uh, how to make our bets. And it's a very, if I can just close, but it's a very difficult time in science because all our funding wants us to say, the bets are in our favor. It's very difficult to go where we really need to go, which is where the bets are not in our favor, but that's where the discoveries are gonna be made. That's where the huge advances are gonna be made. Otherwise, we're just gonna be you know, changing a little bit more salt or a little more pepper. We're not gonna invent a new thing to eat. So, um, I have to say that because I am very worried about how our funding, particularly in medical science, is so focused on translating what we think we know already and not so much on thinking of what we've learned in the last decade that opens up new horizons. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's a better way to end the session and... Uh and to also stimulate new investigators and young investigators. Thanks so yeah. much. And uh, this was a terrific way also to launch the summer. Have a, have have a, a good day, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you for listening. It was great. Thanks.